So this scene, which was found in a recent episode of the Star Wars show, The Book of Boba Fett, is actually a direct reference to the 1972 film Lone Wolf and Cub Sword of Vengeance. Of course, this scene was also in the more famous film Shogun Assassin. Shogun Assassin would go on to earn its place in American pop culture as one of the most notorious exploitation films of the early 80s. It's actually such a famous film that there's even direct music albums influenced by it. If you like this series, check out Jizz's album Liquid Swords. Mike fights a swing swords and cut clown. Shit is too swift to bite you record and write it down. It's regarded as one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time, and it uses a lot of samples from Shogun Assassin. So, Shogun Assassin was always my first introduction to this series. When I first saw that film, I was a young teenager and I just fell in love with its over the top blood and gore and violence. It was awesome. It was perhaps a big influence for Quentin Tarantino. It wasn't until years later that I found out that Shogun Assassin was a part of something much bigger. Lone Wolf and Cub is a series of six films, all of which star the actor Tomisaburo Wakayama, and he plays Ogami Ida. <laughs> This series of films was based off the manga series of the same name, created by the author Kazuo Koike and the artist Gozeki Kojima. The films are part of the Jidai Geki genre. Translated, this means period drama, and such films are usually set during the Edo period of Japanese history. In addition, it is also a Chanbara, which means sword fighting film. So, in the 70s, when this film was made, it was an era of Japanese cinema with more of a relaxed attitude towards depictions of sex and violence. And this led to a lot more freedom and allowed for a politically defiant attitude. And that's a reason why 70s samurai films just feel more exploitative in nature. In addition to a manga series and a film series, there's also a television series. The only thing missing is an anime series, and I'm still holding out for that. Been waiting since the 70s. So the way I watched this film was through the Criterion Blu-ray set and I highly recommend it. It has beautiful cover art and a really nice little booklet. You can just tell that Criterion has a love for these films and they always just treat the re-releases so well. So the first film in the series, The Sword of Vengeance, is really two movies in one. The first is the origin story for the main character, Ido Ogami. Ogami is the shogunate executioner, and him and his son are framed for a crime and they're sentenced to death, but they end up escaping with their lives. And that's the first half of the film. The second half feels like it's just the next installment in a chapter of a series, just continuing the adventures of the two. What's kind of cool is the main actor in this, Wakayama, is brother to the star of the Zatoichi Blind Samurai series. And Wakayama even appeared as a rival to Katsu in the second Zatoichi film. I always thought it was pretty cool how two brothers could be the stars of the biggest samurai series of film. So anyway, Ogami is a highly respected swordsman and he's a loyal subject to the shogunate. The shogunate is unfortunately a tyrant and he punishes his daimyo for the smallest of things in order to maintain his rule. 
Ogami is sent to complete the seppuku that the Shogun demands as punishment. And Ogami always carries it out professionally. And we even see in the very first scene, and it shows Ogami carrying out his duty on a small child who just happens to be a lord. It's kind of an interesting and disturbing setup, just showing a protagonist murdering a child at the start of the film. But Kenji Masumi, the director, leans into the darker aspects of the source manga, and he does so with open eyes. After his wife is murdered, Ogami is then framed for treason by the Yagyu clan, who wishes to take his coveted position as second. The crime that Ogami was accused of was putting the Shogun's crest in his temple dedicated to his victims. But in reality, it was placed there in a raid, supposedly in revenge for the killing of the child lord. Ogami then retaliates by declaring revenge on the Yagyu clan, and he wanders the countryside as an assassin for hire with his infant son, Daiguru. And that's the premise and setup for Lone Wolf and Cub. This is all told in flashbacks to the actual story of the film. And that's why you can consider this film two movies in one. I find that the first film works a lot better as being viewed as part of the series rather than a standalone film. The movie as a whole is 87 minutes long. If all of it had been dedicated to just the origin story, I think that the problem of it seeming a bit too thin would have been better addressed. And you get this scene with bandits at a hot springs that takes up over 30 minutes of the film. And you also get introduced to about a dozen new characters of some importance that don't have any real time to make an impression on you. And I think the film suffers because of this. In this part of the story, Ogami shows up and he convinces the bandits that he's just a man with a child and nothing else. And he spends the rest of the time with the other visitors who are also trapped there because of the gang of bandits. There's also a prostitute that Ogami saves in a really weird scene where he sleeps with her in front of the bandits. And she's well drawn enough as a character. However, there's another samurai that's sick and he's unable to really stand up and fight. He's mostly just a background character. Because of this, the danger to him feels a bit empty because he's not really a character. And that mixed with the implication that this adventure has something to do with Ogami's overall journey makes the whole thing feel like it was just a setup for some really big action scene to take place. And with that being said, the action in this film is awesome. I just love 70s samurai films where they're able to just go all out with the violence and gore. No CGI, all real props. It's just all very entertaining. So overall, the first film in the Lone Wolf and Cub movie is a bit weighed down by its need to tell both an origin story and a continuing adventure in the same 87 minute long film. The origin story aspect is told well enough, but the adventure part gets a bit shorthanded. But by the end of it, I just want to dive into the next installment and I'd say for that, this film succeeds. So if you've seen Lone Wolf and Cub Sword of Vengeance, let me know what you think of it in the comments. And if you want to see more videos like this, don't forget to subscribe and you can support my Patreon to help the channel grow. Thank you.